Number 8. The Coriolis effect means freely moving things like cannonballs or hurricane winds are deflected to the right, but only if you're north of the equator. If you're south of the equator, they're deflected left. Okay, number 8. The Coriolis effect. If you go to my testingglobe.com website and in the main menu, click on Easy Globalist Arguments to Refute. And by the way, just so you know, the way this is organized, this was a... I put my quest for truth, it says, flat Earth, The Flat Earth Controversy, A Biblical Worldview, and One Man's Quest for Truth, 2015. The vast majority of this site was put together in 2015. I added a little bit more to it in 16, you know, here and there. Haven't really done anything with it this year, 2017. But the way this site was developed was very much sort of a like a journal. So you'll see in the very beginning things I'm questioning things I'm, I'm not quite sold on it and as you go through the various articles and stuff that and pages that I put together you'll see that I become more and more convinced over time that's why you'll see things in the early stages that you know seem to indicate that you know I'm not there yet or uh, you know I'm still calling myself a zetetic agnostic and I'm just not convinced completely uh, until you get down to the conclusions page uh, but if you click on the uh, easy globalist arguments to refute, these were some early um, thoughts that I had going through it. And I'm like, man, you know, the arguments we have for the globe just aren't that impressive, really, uh, as I went through this. But as you scroll down, you get down to the top 10 reasons. That's the video that I'm commenting on uh, right now. And you'll see when you get down to number eight. I wrote, admittedly, the Coriolis effect is a good argument and one that I honestly do not have a counter argument for, but that doesn't mean there are none. See, with this one, we are proceeding from a premise to derive a conclusion without considering any other potential premise that could lead to the same conclusion. But how would you know unless you started looking? So in this very early stage, you know, most of the stuff I was just answering off the cuff. You know, I could immediately come up with an answer. In this early stage in the game, I, you know, I was somewhat stumped by the Coriolis effect um, and also the uh, lunar eclipses. That's where I say right here. So really for me, looking at the top 10 reasons why we know the Earth is round, quite a number of them are really lame arguments. With the exception of just two of these 10 arguments, those being number eight and number two. Eight deals with the Coriolis effect, and number two deals with the lunar eclipse. I really don't think we have a very strong case. And of the two that I can't accept and not yet poke holes in, I have not taken the time to look for any alternative possibilities. So at best, I have just two reasons to believe the Earth is round and the usual arguments given to support it. One, the Coriolis effect, and two, lunar eclipses. Again, this is back in probably... April, May, June time frame, 2015. I have since long moved past both of those. And the Coriolis effect, now I, I can't believe I was ever stumped to begin with uh, because it's really kind of lame, actually. And this one's going to be a little bit of a longer one than some of the other ones because I really wanted to take the time to address this issue. And honestly, the whole thing falls apart if this place is not moving, if the earth is not rotating, you could throw out all of the usual arguments for the Coriolis effect. And there's plenty of evidence to show that this place is not moving. So I could pretty much just end it right here. If the earth is not rotating and it's not, then you can throw out pretty much all arguments for the Coriolis effect, but we'll go ahead and get a little deeper into it. And I think probably a good place to start may be, uh, to talk about the Foucault pendulum. Here's a little clip from a video that Eric Dubay put out uh, called Debunking the Spinning Ball Earth. And in this video, he addresses the Foucault pendulum. In the mid 19th century, a Frenchman named Leon Foucault became famous for swinging pendulums and claiming their consequent motions were proof of the Earth's diurnal rotation. Since then, Foucault pendulums have regularly been swinging at museums and exposition halls worldwide, purporting to provide everlasting perpetual proof of the heliocentric spinning ball earth theory. 
The truth is, however, unbeknownst to most of the duped public, that Foucault's pendulum is a failed experiment which proves nothing but how easy it is for pseudoscience to deceive the malleable masses. Lady Blunt says, This pendulum, modern scientists tell us, affords a visible proof that we are living on a whirling globe, which, according to a work on science, now before me is spinning upon its so-called axis at the rate of over a thousand miles an hour at the equator, and in addition to other motions is rushing on an everlasting tour around the sun, the diameter of which is said to be 813,000 miles, and its weight 354,936 times greater than the Earth, from which it is said to be about 93 million miles distant, at the rate of over a thousand miles per minute. Now to prove that the Earth really has these motions, a pendulum is suspended at the show. The showman sets motion and bids the gaping world of thoughtless men and women to behold a proof that we are living on a whirling globe which is rushing away through space. William Carpenter says, Astronomers have made experiments with pendulums which have been suspended from the interior of high buildings and have exulted over the idea of being able to prove the rotation of the earth on its axis by the varying direction taken by the pendulum over a prepared table underneath, asserting that the table moved round under the pendulum instead of the pendulum shifting and oscillating in different directions over the table. But, since it has been found that, as often as not, the pendulum went round the wrong way for the rotation theory, chagrin has taken place of exaltation, and we have a proof of the failure of astronomers in their efforts to substantiate their theory. So to begin with, Foucault's pendulums do not uniformly swing in any one direction. Sometimes they rotate clockwise, and sometimes counterclockwise. Sometimes they fail to rotate, and sometimes they rotate far too much. Scientists who have repeated variations of the experiment have conceded time and again that, quote, it was difficult to avoid giving the pendulum some slight lateral bias at starting. The behavior of the pendulum actually depends on, one, the initial force beginning its swing, and two, the ball and socket joint used which most readily facilitates circular motion over any other. The supposed rotation of the earth is completely inconsequential and irrelevant to the pendulum's swing. If the alleged constant rotation of the Earth affected pendulums in any way, then there should be no need to manually start pendulums in motion. If Earth's diurnal rotation caused the 360-degree uniform diurnal rotation of pendulums, then there should not exist a stationary pendulum anywhere on Earth. Samuel Robotham says, First, when a pendulum constructed according to the plan of Mr. Foucault is allowed to vibrate, its plane of vibration is often variable. Not always. The variation, when it does occur, is not uniform, is not always the same in the same place, nor always the same either in its rate or velocity or in its direction. It cannot therefore be taken as evidence, for that which is inconstant cannot be used in favor of or against any given proposition. It therefore is not evidence and proves nothing. Secondly, if the plane of vibration is observed to change, where is the connection between such change and the supposed motion of the Earth? What principle of reasoning guides the experimenter to the conclusion that it is the Earth which moves underneath the pendulum, and not the pendulum which moves over the Earth? What logical right or necessity forces one conclusion in preference to the other? Thirdly, why was not the peculiar arrangement of the point of suspension of the pendulum specially considered in regards to its possible influence upon the plane of oscillation? Was it not known, or was it overlooked, or was it in the climax of theoretical revelry ignored that a ball and socket joint is one which facilitates circular motion more readily than any other? Okay, now this socket joint thing is rather interesting. Uh, about a year or two ago, I went to the Griffith Observatory in Hollywood, and uh, you know it's a pretty famous observatory. It's been in a lot of movies and stuff like that. It's the one up on the mountain across from the Hollywood sign. And uh, of course, when you, as soon as you walk in, immediately, well, as soon as you walk in the door, it, it's a, a a dome, sort of like the Capitol Dome in Washington D.C., and it's lined with paintings of science mixed with pagan gods. So there's your first clue, <laughs> right off the bat. You got science mixed with pagan false gods, which I would contend are 
um, fallen angels, Nephilim, demons, you know, they fall into that category. All right, so just below the dome there, you have uh, probably one of the more famous Foucault pendulums here in the United States. Now, listen to what the tour guide had to say about how this thing works. If you're wondering how we keep it going, we keep it going with an electromagnet. Otherwise, due to air friction, it would slow down. We'd have to jump in there every hour or so and give it a push. But our electromagnet keeps it going even after we close at night. It keeps going and going and uh, swinging back and forth even after we close. Because there's an electromagnet gently pushing this, overcoming the laws of gravity and wind resistance. Otherwise, the pendulum would slow down and stop spinning. So, otherwise someone would have to go down there, like when it was originally invented, and keep pushing the pendulum every so often to keep it in motion. Otherwise it would slow down, and every 15 minutes we'd have to go down there and push 240 pounds of brass to keep it in motion. So, there's some kind of magnet making that thing move? In the ceiling, there's a blue ring up there. Want to look up there? The magnet is helping overcome the force of gravity, keeping this pendulum in motion. Otherwise, it would slow down and stop like the smaller model that we'll do here in a short amount of time. So, I wanted to do a video on something called a Foucault pendulum. You also hear it called a Foucault pendulum. Um, these are pendulums that are uh, supposed to demonstrate the spin of the earth, but not everyone realizes that they actually have a magnetic uh, drive um, plugged into electricity uh, that keeps them moving. Now, um, the only reason I know this is because I worked for a construction company that installed one. And that last guy was a friend of mine, Matthew Long. His YouTube channel is Thu Long. And uh, you can go ahead and watch the rest of this video right here uh, describing his experiences having installed a Foucault pendulum and uh, what the issues are with regard to the motor that keeps the thing going. You may also want to just Google the Alais effect. I think that's how you say it. A-L-L-A-I-S, which describes how, oddly enough, Solar eclipses can cause Foucault pendulums to do all kinds of weird stuff. Slow down, speed up, you know, go backwards. <laughs> Lots of interesting anomalies regarding the Foucault pendulum seem to happen when there's an eclipse. But wait a minute, I thought this thing operates because the Earth is rotating. And why should it care about the movement of celestial bodies that are the closest ones over a quarter of a million miles away and the other one's 93 million miles away. So why does an alignment in the Copernican model affect Foucault pendulums? I, there's some interesting things to look at regarding this thing. And, you know, frankly, I'm convinced it's just a smoke and mirror parlor trick. Now let's go back to the Eric DeBay commentary where he's talking about the Foucault pendulum. Lady Blunt says, we believe, with all due deference to the pendulum and its proprietor, that it proves nothing but the craftiness of the inventor, and we can only describe the show and showman as deceptions. A thing so childish as this pendulum proof that it can only be described as one of the most simple and ridiculous attempts to gull the public that has ever been conceived. It has been said that the pendulum experiment proves the rotation of the earth, but this is quite impossible, for one pendulum turns one way, and sometimes another pendulum turns in the opposite direction. Now we ask, does the earth rotate in opposite directions at different places at one and the same time? We should like to know. Perhaps the experimenters will kindly enlighten us on this point. If the Earth had the terrible motions attributed to it, there would be some sensible effects of such motions. But we neither feel the motion, see it, nor hear it. And how people can stand watching the pendulum vibrate and think that they are seeing a proof of the motions of the Earth almost passes comprehension. They are, however, brought up to believe it, and it is thought to be scientific to believe what the astronomers teach. Also in the mid-19th century, another Frenchman named Gaspard Gustave Coriolis performed several experiments showing the effect of kinetic energy on rotating systems, which have ever since become mythologized as proof of the heliocentric theory. 
The Coriolis effect is often said to cause sinks and toilet bowls in the northern hemisphere to drain spinning in one direction, while in the southern hemisphere causing them to spin the opposite way, thus providing proof of the spinning ball earth. Once again, however, just like Foucault's pendulums spinning either which way, sinks and toilets in the northern and southern hemisphere do not constantly spin in any one direction. Sinks and toilets in the very same household are often found to spin in opposite directions, depending entirely upon the shape of the basin and the angle of the water's entry, not the supposed rotation of the earth. Jennifer Horton wrote, while the premise makes sense that the Earth's eastward spin would cause the water in a toilet bowl to spin as well, in reality, the force and speed at which the water enters and leaves the receptacle is much too great to be influenced by something as minuscule as a single 360-degree turn over the span of a day. When all is said and done, the Coriolis effect plays no larger a role in toilet flushes than it does in the revolution of CDs in your stereo. The things that really determine the direction in which water leaves your toilet or sink are the shape of the bowl and the angle at which the liquid initially enters the bowl. The Coriolis effect is also said to affect bullet trajectories and weather patterns as well, supposedly causing most storms in the northern hemisphere to rotate counterclockwise and most storms in the southern hemisphere to rotate clockwise, to cause bullets from long-range guns to tend towards the right of the target in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Again, however, the same problems remain. Not every bullet and not every storm consistently displays the behavior and therefore cannot reasonably be used as proof of anything. What about the precision of the sight aperture, human error, and wind? What about Mickelson, Morley, and Gale's proven motion of the ether's potential effect? Why does the Coriolis effect affect most storms but not all? If some storms rotate clockwise in the north and counterclockwise in the south, how do those storms escape the Coriolis force? And if the entire Earth's spin is uniform, why should the two hemispheres be affected any differently? Coriolis's effect and Foucault's pendulum are both said to prove the Earth moves beneath our feet, but in reality only prove how easy it can be for wolves in sheep's clothing to pull the wool over our eyes. Yes, indeed. And when I first started looking into Flat Earth and started posting stuff, I started getting lots of responses like the following video regarding long-range shooters and how they allegedly have to adjust for the Coriolis effect as a result of the rotation of the Earth. One of the common issues is that we see is the Coriolis effect. And what guys are not doing is taking into account the effect that this can have on your shooting at longer ranges. Now, real quick, let's kind of just uh, explain the Coriolis effect in layman's terms. Uh, the Coriolis effect is the effect that when the bullet leaves the barrel of the gun, it is actually leaving the surface of the earth. So as the bullet leaves the, the barrel of the gun, the earth is still rotating and the bullet is not rotating with the earth. So the earth will actually rotate out from underneath of the bullet while it is in flight. So as the earth rotates, it actually rotates from the west to the east. So what that's gonna do to our targets is, is if you're shooting west, your target's going to rotate up and towards us, which is going to cause the bullets to hit lower. And if you're facing east, the target's going to be dropping and slightly moving away, which is going to cause the hits to be higher. Coriolis errors are caused by the Earth's rotation. When a bullet is fired from a gun, it will take a certain amount of time to reach the target. While it is traveling, the target is dropping or rising according to the Earth's rotation. The motion from the Earth's rotation can be split into two components, one that is in the direction of the bullet's flight and one that is perpendicular to the bullet's flight in the vertical direction. For a typical long-range cartridge, the bullet flight time to 1,000 yards is approximately 1.5 seconds. The effect is negated when shooting north or south and opposite when shooting east or west. When shooting east, the point of impact would be high and when shooting west, it will be low. Okay, let me just pause here for a second and draw your attention to what this narrator just said. The effect is negated when shooting north or south. Okay, so let that sink in. 
allegedly shooters have to adjust if they're shooting east to west because the target you know supposedly is on a rotating earth and as soon as the bullet leaves the muzzle it's going out in the air toward a target that is either allegedly rolling up over the ball toward you or rolling down and away from you on the ball east to west you know depending on which way you're shooting well that does how could that be negated if you're shooting north or south how could that be a non issue if you're having to chase a target or a target's rushing up on you because the earth is rotating, then if you're shooting north or south, you should have to adjust either to the left or to the right because that target's also going to be moving in that direction. Because of, as we just established, the target's supposedly moving from the west to the east. You know, So they kind of just contradicted themselves, really. Um, beyond that, okay, the, the logic is because of the Coriolis effect of the Earth spinning, if you're shooting in a certain direction, that bullet that's traveling very fast within like one to two seconds, right? If that, I mean, really fast, is going so fast from the from the muzzle of the weapon to the target, the Earth moved so fast underneath that speeding bullet that you have to adjust to compensate it for it. And yet I could hover a helicopter for a half hour and the next state didn't show up? I mean, the Earth is rotating so fast that a long-range shooter has to compensate so his bullet lands on target, you know, without missing it because the, it rolled away from him. Then airplane and helicopter pilots or frisbee and football throwers should have some major problems because <laughs> that stuff's going a lot slower than a bullet. Now, here's a video archive of one of the radio shows that I did with Sean McCary. Now, Sean is a Sparrow Surface Missile System instructor. He's a master training specialist in the U.S. Navy, okay? Listen to what he has to say about the whole idea of allegedly having to uh, adjust weapons for the Coriolis effect and for the alleged curve of the Earth. I am a missile uh, system instructor right now. I teach it to the new fleet of the Navy, and... Uh, Prior to that, I was a NATO Sea Sparrow surface missile system uh, operator out in the fleet. And, you know, we went through very, very regular, rigorous uh, training, electronic training, troubleshooting, operation, uh, everything. We have detailed schematics on how our system actually works, all the way down to how the circuitry of all the circuit cards that run our system are laid out. And... Um, you know, I, like you said, I can't get into anything super specific, but I will tell you that with my missile system, uh, we have the ability to track something, you know, 50 nautical miles away with our, our radar that we use for this missile system. And uh, as far as uh, this specific missile system goes, the way it essentially works is, you know, let's say we're tracking some enemy aircraft. Um, and it's, you know, 45 nautical miles away, which is over, you know, 50 miles away. Um, first of all, you have to understand that our radar, uh, the band, the beam width on it is only two degrees uh, from its point of origin, which is the radar itself. And it's a fire control radar, which means that it's not like a normal search radar that just spins all day arbitrarily. Uh, it's a tracking radar, so it stays fixed to the target that it's tracking. It's not sweeping it, uh, you know, every few seconds. It's looking right at it all the time. That's how we maintain our track. Um, so you have to ask yourself, okay, well, it's a two-degree pencil beam. It's looking at something 45 nautical miles away. Um, <laughs> that's not possible if it was flying, if the target was flying at like, you know, 100 200 foot off the off the ground <laughs> that should still be you know well below the horizon of a curved model and uh i have no problem tracking a target like that absolutely none uh, i can stay locked up on it all the way till it flies over my ship okay um, so now wait now what at what altitude are you above the the surface of the uh ocean from your tracking station the surface of the ocean, um, my the radar itself is roughly 
mm, it's like 120, 130 feet above waterline. Okay, so you're 100 feet above the waterline, and you're tracking something else that's about 100 feet above the waterline. You know, what aircraft or or another ship that's on the waterline, or you know, anything. Yeah, we'll say we'll say aircraft for now. <laughs> okay, okay. So you're talking about aircraft. Well, wouldn't they be flying higher, or would that that would be? Why would they be flying mm-hmm. that low? Well, they would be flying that low because most people think when they hear about a plane, they they think commercial, you know, plane, 30,000 feet. However, when I'm talking from a perspective of my weapon system, it's meant to shoot down bad guys. And what do bad guys do? They take a low-flying profile and they sea skim off the uh, surface of the water. Reason for that is because they like to defeat the blind zones in you know a radar's wave propagation the closer the closer they can fly to the deck or the water line the the more you know invisible they are on a radar um so that's why i say uh, 100 200 foot okay so then if if it's flying about 100 feet off the deck then it's flying pretty close to level to where the 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 height of your radar system then. yes so we're talking, you know, give or take, fairly even ground on both ends. At, at a, this is 45 nautical miles. I just uh, punched up a nautical to statute mile converter. That's about 51.7 statute miles away, which on a ball is – that's just ridiculous. Uh, 50 miles on a ball would be 1,667 feet below the curvature. But yep. yet now, is this a line of sight deal, or is this um, this uh, pencil radar you're talking about? Two it is a line of it is a line of sight radar. Um, the argument always comes up: well, you know, it's radar refraction off the you know ion sphere, you yep. know, in the in the atmosphere, and that's always the argument with like major wideband search radars. Well, guess what? Mine's not a search radar; it's a fire control radar which means that it has to be so accurate it's used to determine our intercept point for the target that we're shooting at. And it has to maintain a direct line of sight lock on the target to actually strike it with radio frequency and then receive that reflected radio frequency back into our receiver and maintain the track on the target. Wow, that's just... Uh, at the very least, it is proving that if we are on a ball, it's way bigger than what we've been told. So either, no matter what, we've been lied to. Yep. So, okay, so this thing, this pencil beam, this is tracking something. And you're actually watching something 50 statute miles away at roughly the same altitude as you are. So, you know, that, that alleviates the question of, well, maybe you're higher, so you've got a greater field of view or whatever. You're tracking something that's about the same level. Correct. Wow. Yeah. And that's just one aspect of it all. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going into more detail than that. <laughs> bring, bring it on. Whatever else you're able to share, bring it on. All right. So, for instance, we got the tracking of the target out of the way. Now, NATO Sea Sparrow's missile system works upon a semi-active doctrine. And for any of those technical buffs out there, you probably know what I'm talking about. But the way our missile goes after a target, let's say we already established tracking it, let's say it's within our missile's uh, engageability envelope now, which is only about 10 nautical miles, which isn't very far, I understand that. But let me hit people with this. Um, when we shoot our missile, uh, our missile uh, is based upon what the reflected energy from the transmitter is. So that's how it goes after the target once it's in flight. It's a semi-active missile, meaning that it has to have a constant lacing, so to speak, of the target um, by that transmitter, by that, uh, you know, that RF coming out. It has to have an external designation source. So at any point, if that designation source isn't tracking the target, then the missile is essentially blind, so to speak. Um, so what that draws into it all is whenever that missile is in flight, there's absolutely no signals that are being sent to it that deal 
with the Coriolis effect, there's no signals that deal with curvature and dealing with you know curvature trigonometry it's based upon a planar model even our fire control computer whenever nato was established and came together as a big think tank to to make this weapon system it had 13 countries involved with it and you know several of these countries created different parts of the system and it all got the the name of uh weapons defense contractor by the name of raytheon slapped on the title of it and, um, you know, when you look at this thing, the, the radar that calculates all this, uh, you know, the intercept points and, you know, how fast the target's going, what our missile's doing, this computer, it comes from a Norwegian tank. That's the computer. So it's based upon old technology of firing artillery shots, which only deal with an X and a Y coordinate scheme. Okay. <laughs> which for anyone that doesn't know that's a flat model that's not a curved model <laughs> yeah okay so th- this system was taken from a ground based deal now that coriolis thing uh cuz one of the early pushbacks that I got when I first started looking into this was from infantry guys and you know guys are shooters and they they always were about the coriolis effect saying you know long range shooters always have to adjust for the Coriolis effect, but it seems to only apply to bullets because it, <laughs> what I could tell, it doesn't apply to to uh, missiles. It doesn't apply to cannonballs. It doesn't apply to well, pretty much anything except bullets. What? So, uh, is that correct? What 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 would your answer to that be? Well, my answer to this would be I absolutely have no faith in the Coriolis effect at all because first of all, you're talking to someone that believes in the flat Earth. Coriolis effect doesn't exist. Second off, the people that sit there and acclaim, you know, oh yeah, we have to take this super long sniper shot, the Coriolis effect, into account for this super long shot. I think that has to deal with self aggrandizement and brainwashing, honestly, because it's not something that's taught from a practical sense whenever these people are trained on any of this. Uh, you know, long range snipers are taught, you know, distance and windage. That's all they're taught. And Whenever you think about it, the scientific community that brings up the Coriolis effect, <laughs> like the other day, um, what's his name, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he tweeted that some football game, they missed the game-winning field goal because of the Coriolis effect and how it shifted the ball, you know, uh, three-quarters of an inch to the right and made it miss, you know, outside of the pole. <laughs> and I say this, you know, if that's true, and that was only a 40-yard field goal, and it moved it three-quarters of an inch, let's go ahead and re-examine how long these sniper shots are. You know, some of them are up to a mile to a mile and a half away. <laughs> you, you have to conceptualize this. If the Coriolis effect has that much of an impact at 40 yards, let's go ahead and ramp it up to, you know, uh, a 1,000 yards. <laughs> you're talking about huge deviations from where you're originally aiming at. <laughs> but, but some of these guys, I mean, they say they have these arguments. I've seen the videos where they got these, you know, reality TV show guys talking about it and, you know, talking about, you know, the long range weapons and how they work. But it seems like because I've heard stuff from other people that other than uh, long range shooters of bullets, you know, people who shoot you know, other things and they it doesn't seem to play into it. I mean, does does. Do you ever have to adjust for Coriolis effect if you're shooting a, a missile? Or a, I'll put it to a you. Cannon? I'll put it to you this way: the missile. I don't even think it's arguable that I can hit a target much further away than a sniper can. Um, and I will tell you this: there is absolutely no circuitry designed into the engineering of our missile system that accounts for anything closely resembling a Coriolis effect. Absolutely not. Not at all. Okay, so here you have a highly trained specialist in the U.S. Navy saying that he can paint a target with a pencil beam line of sight laser at significant distances that should not be possible on a globe. And also saying that, no, we don't have to make any allowances for the Coriolis effect or anything like that. So there's a Navy guy. Now, there's another interview that I heard Mark Sargent do with a guy that's a 
a, a master gunner in the, I think he was in the army. Check this out. So you and I were talking and you had some insights on uh, the gyro system, firing solutions, uh, the Coriolis effect. Can you, can you kind of elaborate on when you were like looking at the flat earth thing and you know, how you, how you contacted me, what, what kind of brought you to this whole thing? Well, uh, the uh, couple of interviews I've heard you do mm-hmm. and talks and debates and whatnot, one thing I can always remember that one guy you were talking to that was talking about when he sh- shoots his rifle yeah. to the east and it drops and to the west it rises. Yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> Which was, yeah, yeah that. <laughs> yeah, I will say that um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily doubt doubt that he thinks that he has a rise and drop when he's going well, to no. the west. But I mean, I had a sniper instructor, you know, contact me and said, "Look, I trained for three years in the Marine Corps." He goes, "The Coriolis effect does not take into, you know, the, it's not even in the manual." No. The um, so background on the tanks to show you how precise they can be when we uh, we what we do calculate for mm-hmm. at least the computers and everything else. Is things like barometric pressure, oh. the ammunition temperature, the air temperature, uh, crosswind, and um, any changes in those. And we demonstrate it, you know, in schools and whatnot, of how ten degree difference will make the round totally different change. Yeah. But I can shoot east, west, north, or south, and it never affects. If all those settings are in, <laughs> nice, nice. I see. I didn't even. You, that's new to me. I didn't realize that. No, barometric pressure doesn't necessarily surprise me, because that's like water pressure. You know, if you if you've got yeah, the, especially because you're shooting distances, uh, and you don't have to give away anything. But I mean, you're shooting twenty, thirty miles roughly. I mean, if you're no, 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 not for the um, long shots. No, 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 not for the long shots. I mean. We average your probably tanks will shoot target engagements two kilometers, but we can shoot you know around four kilometers or so accurately. Accurately, but, on no. the move. Okay. <laughs> so that's where the uh, gyros and all that come in. But we can go across terrain up and down and hit a target out there. Got it. Now, now howitzers can shoot. You know, artil- the artillery guys they they're designed to do the lob shots, but tanks rarely do any lob shots of any. No, we don't. We don't do uh, what's called indirect fire anymore. We're very direct. We like to see who we're, you know, got us shooting. <laughs> but no, I will that, say the go ahead the, the rounds. So and it's rare, but occasionally you know somebody will mess up and shoot a round too high or something, or you know, out of the range that we're supposed to. Mm-hmm. And one thing that we're taught to do is well, we have to find out where that round went. Ah, oh, got it. So uh, we do. We can. We know all the calculations. You know, given the angle and the temperature and the barometric pressure and all that, approximately where that round went. And they can go pretty far. Got it. Accidentally, but again, we don't count curvature of Earth to calculate where that round might have accidentally landed. Good, good point. And, and yeah, let, let me address that here in a second. The um, but I, because I want to, I want to clarify. So direct fire, that's target to, point to point. You know, you looking at an enemy piece and engaging them, usually a, a fairly horizontal shot. Tanks used to be, I, which is why I brought it up. Used to be, you know, they could park themselves, elevate the gun, and just start letting them fly. But you guys, yeah, but that's I think. The M60 series was the last one to do that. But that's it. Those tanks now, it's all about precision, and you guys don't, like you were saying, you don't take any random shots. It's all as, as accurate as possible. Kind of like a sniper. Yeah, it's you know, it's like a sniper. Once we shoot, well, they're going to know where we are, so. Ah, good. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, so when uh, when you guys are shooting, you know, let's say four kilometers or two kilometers, whatever your average is, um, your gyro is involved in in that shot, right? Yeah, so we have a stabilization system. So as we're moving across terrain or anything else, as you know, you're bouncing around, the uh, gyros when we activate them to activate the gun keeps the gun on a, on the target. So it keeps the gun wherever the, basically the gyro was pointed ah. to keep it steady, including left and right and everything else. So no matter what angle I'm traveling at, if I'm holding that gun, then gravity or not or anything else that gun tube is going to stay exactly where 
was last pointed. Nice. And and the perfect example of that is going over rises, you know, up and down hills, no matter what, that gyro is going to keep it because it's tied the, via the computers to the gun. It's going to keep that gun right on target as much as possible. Yes, it will. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. And, and, and talk about, yeah, talk about a system that, you know, because you guys are bouncing around a lot. If you're in a moving combat situation, you know, whether you're training or it's real, a tank is moving around a ton you know, in relation to that, that line of fire. Oh yeah. We, uh, it goes up and down quite a bit, quite a ride yeah. in there. Yeah. That's, that's, that's amazing. Uh, so if the gyro, okay. So in, and in your case, you're spinning, if I'm not mistaken, again, correct me here. Cause I don't know everything about everything. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the, you have to spin the gyro up, uh, up and down repeatedly when you're, when you're acquiring new targets, right? Well, what, the way it works Stabilization. As soon as we basically, when I say active, we grab the gun to point at a target. Gyros automatically come. They're always running, but they're they link the gun to the, that position that it's at at that moment. Oh, okay, okay. So it's always more. Well, as soon as you start the, t- the tank up, it's spun up like a plane. Yes, where, where it's where it's spun up on the ground. And then, but it acclimates to wherever you're pointing. So as soon as you, whatever it is, you pull the trigger, you know, not pull the trigger, but as soon as you start sighting, as soon as you take over the gun, uh, it follows it. Yes. Wow. Exactly. That's awesome. And that system's been around for quite a while. Yes, it has. And at least since the 60s. So Really? Now, I did not know that. So, but back in the '60s, you know, because p- some people were saying, uh, you know, because I've gotten uh, some flack for this, where because you know, they'll say, "Well, with planes, it doesn't really count because it's all computers and they adjust for the curvature of the Earth, and the computers mess with the gyro." I go, "Well, then, what did the World War II planes use? Because they weren't using computers." So, with the '60s tanks, I would imagine they didn't have much in the way of uh, of computer guidance, did they? Or was it just it was, it was kind of a rough sh- kind of a makeshift thing back in the 60s and just kept getting better and better yeah it got better and better but i mean you got to think it's a pretty simple system the gyro spinning when you say wherever the gyro at the current position when you uh activate the gun yeah it just says no matter what the gyro changes keep it at that position with with the gyro so as you're bouncing up and down it's just staying in that position nice nice and you get and and you never of course when you're doing this like like anything because i the People that I've talked to, like the pilots, people say, well, all the pilots have to be in on this. Don't the pilots know, you know, that there's something wrong with the whole curvature calculation and the whole uh, Coriolis effect? And, you know, aren't they all in? And I go, why, why would they be in? It's the last thing on their minds. Kind of like you. When you were doing tours, firing off rounds, uh, it never – I'm sure it never, ever occurred to you. It's like, oh, yeah, by the way, I wonder how that gyro does work on the curvature, you know, if it's, if it's curved earth. Yeah. Yeah, it's never thought of it. Just yeah. one of those things that you do. And, <laughs> yeah. And then the um, – if also I'm not mistaken, the uh, – because the artillery guys, I'd like to, to chime in on this. Uh, we've got uh, five minutes to the break roughly, first break, which is um, – there was something – because people said – I talked to two scientists recently. I don't know if you listened to uh, the debate I had with um, Brian Dunning and that Mark – What's yes. his, yeah, the guy that ended up going up to his hotel room and, and drinking himself to sleep, I think. The, um, uh, one of them said, oh, yeah, the Coriolis effect of, you know, affects – completely affects ballistics, you know, anything that's launched at, or fired. And the other guy said, no, no, it doesn't affect it at all. So you got two scientists with conflicting views. But my argument has always been, you know, whether it's a sniper or a howitzer or a missile or a tank – that you would, I mean, you would run into some really, really big problems calcu- calculation wise with the with the firing solution. Yeah, the um, you know, and our tanks have all these great computers that does most of the calculations for us. But however, like any good backup system, we have a complete manual backup system that we use with basically a um, a sided scope next to the gun. <laughs> and just uh, look through the glass. Just look through the glass yeah. with the reticle, just to give me the uh, distance markers yep. and uh yeah i use that all the time the only thing we calculate for is if a moving target is delete it 
<laughs> so nice, nice. But but so people that are they're listening out there, if you don't understand what we're talking about, the Coriolis effect, and that is that the Earth is spinning, and if the Earth is spinning, mainstream science will tell you that it affects projectiles, uh, you know, like cannon fire. There's there's people out there saying, oh yeah, it affects cannon fire. I'm going well. There's a problem with that with the military, and again, I, I'm I'm a big military history uh, guy, and and you can you can attest to this and that is especially with tanks i mean artillery for example if you were going to engage a target you would have to not only would you have to figure out how far away it was and what kind of round you were going to use but then you have to figure out okay which way am i facing you know northwest southeast you know whatever you're facing and then on top of that you've also got to figure out because remember the the spinning of the earth is supposedly a thousand miles at the equator and then it ramps down all the way to zero at the north pole so you've got to figure out where you are on the on the globe you've got to figure all this stuff in and to my knowledge i've never heard of anyone calculating these extra things when they're firing no <laughs> i've never heard of it either <laughs> And and you you've done five tours and you've been and not only you know yeah you shoot tank rounds but uh, I'm sure you've had buddies and other other branches and no let me ask you this I'll I'll, I'll throw you the the question that kind of came out of the surveyor because the surveyor said that not only did he never use the curvature of the Earth uh, but it was never even talked about so in your case did you the Coriolis effect you never even heard about that being discussed in any firing solution as far as no, you know never. And if it was real, you you know full well that that's what something you would have to take into account. I mean, I mean maybe maybe not the the speed of the spinning of the Earth, depending on where you are, whether you're the Middle East versus you know the equator, but definitely the um, the direction. Well, the one thing that I always um, and your clues brought me on to this, you know, is uh, one of your questions about um, the airplanes moving east and west, California, New York, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. So. My round, like when the sniper was talking about, you know, the round going and the earth turning, mm-hmm. well, if that was the case, and I'm pretty sure that would be the same for airplanes, which it isn't. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 you're absolutely right. Air- I mean, my rounds travel with the earth or whatever, but like airplanes, so there is no effect. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, mainstream science still won't say, you know, it, sometimes they'll, like, the argument, well, planes don't travel fast enough. I'm going, really, what's the what's the escape velocity to escape the curve, you know, the spinning of the Earth? What, what's that supposed to be? Because the plane is really just a slow-moving bullet. That's all it is. I mean, it's still a projectile. It's flying at 500, 600 miles an hour. That's still pretty fast. I mean, yeah, it's not a, it's not a rifle round or, or a howitzer or whatever you guys are using. Uh, what are you guys, like a 105 millimeter or something? Am I wrong? 120. 120? Wow, it's big. The, um, uh, but it, yeah, it's so, it, so the, the, the argument there, what he's talking about, guys, is if a plane is, going, is landing, trying to land on a runway, and this plane is moving at hundreds of miles an hour, shouldn't the runway be moving either you know towards them you know in addition to you know closing the distance it should be moving either with or against the spin of the earth and you know is the, is the plane doing just east west runways because if you're doing north south runways then you get a whole new set of problems yeah all right let's continue i'm going to read from edward hendry's book the greatest lie on earth proof that our world is not a moving globe And in my copy of the book, he covers the Coriolis effect in Chapter 8, titled No Coriolis Effect Proves a Stationary Earth, which, uh, again, in this edition begins on page 79. One principle of movement on a spinning globe is that the spinning will necessarily produce what is known as a Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect was first postulated by Gustave Gaspard Coriolis, a French engineer, mathematician, and physicist who was born on May 21, 1792 and died on September 19, 1843. The Encyclopedia Britannica states that the Coriolis effect is, quote, an effect of motion on a rotating body of paramount importance to meteorology, ballistics, and oceanography, end quote. The Encyclopedia Britannica further explains the Coriolis force as it pertains to the supposedly spinning spherical Earth as follows, quote, In 1835, he, Coriolis, published a paper titled On the Equations of Relative Motion of Systems of Bodies, 
in which he showed that on a rotating surface, in addition to the ordinary effects of motion of a body, there is an inertial force acting on the body at right angles to its direction of motion. This force results in a curved path for a body that would otherwise travel in a straight line. The Coriolis force on Earth determines the general wind directions and is responsible for the rotation of hurricanes and tornadoes." End quote. The Encyclopedia Britannica provides a graphic to explain the Coriolis force on the supposedly spinning globular Earth. The graphic is represented below. The problem with the above illustration from the Encyclopedia Britannica is that it has no basis in fact. The Coriolis force is very real. If the Earth were in fact a spinning globe, the Coriolis effect would be manifested. The problem is that there is no such Coriolis effect taking place on Earth, which means that the Earth is not spinning. The different directions of rotation of hurricanes in northern and southern latitudes has nothing to do with the claimed Coriolis effect of the spinning Earth. Planes that fly north and south do not adjust their flight paths to account for any Coriolis effect. For example, assuming the heliocentric model with the Earth traveling at more than a thousand miles per hour at the equator, the Coriolis effect would cause a plane flying from Buffalo, New York to Miami, Florida to fly off course in a westerly direction due to the supposed faster spin of the Earth as the plane approaches the wider circumference of the Earth at the latitude of Miami, Florida. Yet in reality, the flight arrives in Miami on time and without the pilot having to adjust for any Coriolis effect due to the rotation of the Earth. Indeed, if there was a Coriolis effect, it would be nearly impossible to land a plane on a runway. A runway that runs north and south would be careening at approximately 1,000 miles per hour across the path of the plane, which would make it impossible to line up the plane for a landing. The Coriolis effect for spinning objects is real. Modern scientists must sell the myth that there is a Coriolis effect manifested on the Earth in order to make the spinning Earth seem real. The fact that there is no Coriolis effect on the Earth creates a real problem for scientists. Their solution to that little problem is to lie. They claim that there is a Coriolis effect when there is not. The following from the National Geographic is an example of the modern explanation of the Coriolis effect that is supposed to be manifested on Earth but is, in fact, completely absent. Quote, Let's pretend you're standing at the equator and you want to throw a ball to your friend in the middle of North America. If you throw the ball in a straight line, it will appear to land to the right of your friend because it's moving slower and has not caught up. Now let's pretend you're at the North Pole. When you throw the ball to your friend, it will again appear to land to the right of him but this time it's because he's moving faster than you are and has moved ahead of the ball. This apparent deflection is the Coriolis effect. Fast-moving objects such as airplanes and rockets are influenced by the Coriolis effect. Pilots must take the Earth's rotation into account when charting flights over long distances. This means most planes are not flown in straight lines, even if the airports are directly across the continent from each other. The line between Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon, for instance, is very long and very straight. However, a plane flying from Portland, Oregon could not fly in a straight line and land in Portland, Maine. Flying east, the Coriolis effect seems to bend to the right in a southerly direction. If the Oregon pilot flew in a straight line, the plane would end up near New York or Pennsylvania. Military aircraft and missile control technology must calculate the Coriolis effect for similar reasons. The target of an air raid would be missed entirely, and innocent people and civilian structures could be damaged. The Coriolis force applies to movement on rotating objects. It is determined by the mass of the object and the object's rate of rotation. The Coriolis force is perpendicular to the object's axis. The Earth spins on its axis from west to east. The Coriolis force, therefore, acts in a north-south direction. The Coriolis force is zero at the equator. Though the Coriolis force is used in mathematical equations, there is actually no physical force involved. Instead, it is just the ground moving at a different speed than an object in the air. End quote. The National Geographic is just one of many examples of a massive deception. The Earth is supposed to be spinning at approximately 1,000 miles per hour at the equator. Because the circumference of a ball is smaller north and south of the equator, the Earth does not spin at as great a speed at higher and lower latitudes. 
Portland, Oregon is at 45 degrees north latitude from the equator, and the purported spin of the Earth at that latitude is approximately 700 miles per hour. Portland, Maine is at 44 degrees north latitude, with the spin of the Earth only a tiny bit faster than 700 miles per hour. The Coriolis effect is supposed to put the plane in New York if the pilot simply tried to fly the plane straight and level toward Portland, Maine. That is simply not true. The pilot sets his heading toward Portland, Maine and accounts only for wind conditions. The pilot makes no accommodation whatsoever for a Coriolis effect. Because the Earth is not spinning, there is no Coriolis effect to calculate. The National Geographic alleges that, quote, military aircraft and missile control technology must calculate the Coriolis effect, end quote, which has already been debunked by two experts, one from the Navy and one from the U.S. Army, as we've just heard. Edward Hendry continues in his book, National Geographic cites no authority for its statement for the simple reason that no authority exists. No authority exists because... It is not true. The National Geographic is simply making things up to fool the gullible public into believing that the Earth is spinning at an incredible speed. The theory of the Coriolis effect in the National Geographic example is that the eastbound plane would be able to keep up with the speed of the alleged spinning Earth because the plane at takeoff would be adding its speed to the 700 mile per hour speed of the runway in Portland, Oregon. The problem with that argument is that it assumes that the runway is lined up due east and the plane is taking off from a runway in a due east direction. The Coriolis effect is supposed to be based upon the spin of the Earth and the fact that objects in motion over the spinning Earth are moving independent of the spin of the Earth once they are in motion. If there truly were a Coriolis effect on Earth, it would pose a real problem for plane flights. If a plane were to take off from an airport in Portland, Oregon in a north-south runway and turn east to fly to Portland, Maine, the plane would never make it to Portland, Maine. That is because the plane would be traveling at approximately 560 miles per hour once it reached cruising altitude. The Earth, however, would be spinning at 700 miles per hour eastbound beneath the plane. The plane would never be able to catch up with the speed of the Earth's spin. The plane would be constantly losing distance over the ground at the rate of 140 miles per hour. Essentially, the plane would be moving backwards over the ground. What is found is exactly the opposite. A plane traveling eastbound from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine would in fact have a shorter flight time than a plane traveling westbound from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon. The reason has nothing to do with the spin of the Earth. The high-velocity eastbound winds at high altitude, known as the jet stream, carry the planes along and allow eastbound flights to have a faster ground speed. The jet stream can have wind speeds ranging from 60 miles per hour to over 250 miles per hour. That same jet stream is a hindrance to westbound flights. It was reported in January 2015 that a British Airways Boeing 777-200 jet was able to travel at ground speeds in excess of 745 miles per hour as it traveled in the eastbound jet stream of approximately 250 miles per hour. Incidentally, the speed of sound is 760 miles per hour at sea level. David Wardlaw Scott explains experiments done in England at the turn of the 20th century using a cannon which showed that there was no Coriolis effect whatsoever manifested on the Earth, thus indicating that the Earth is motionless. In the experiments, a cannon was fixed firmly on the ground in a precisely vertical position. The cannon was fired. The cannonball ascended for 14 seconds vertically, and it took 14 seconds for the cannonball to fall back to the Earth for a total of 28 seconds aloft. If the Earth were traveling eastward at 600 miles per hour at the latitude of England, the cannonball would be expected to land almost 5 miles to the west of the cannon. However, that did not happen. The cannonball fell generally within 2 feet of the cannon. In a couple of instances, the cannonball actually returned to the cannon's mouth. If there was any spin to the Earth causing a Coriolis effect, it would have been discovered by now. Yet every single experiment ever performed to detect the motion of the Earth has returned a null result, e.g. the Michelson-Morley experiment. Real-life experiments have proven that there is no Coriolis effect on Earth because the Earth is stationary. 
Governmental education systems, however, persist in pushing the myth of a Coriolis effect on a supposedly spinning Earth. Indeed, they must argue that there is a Coriolis effect, because if they let it be known that there is no Coriolis effect, that would let the cat out of the bag that the Earth is stationary. For example, below is an illustration from the Coastal Practice Network, which is funded by the European Union Regional Development Fund. Figure 54, Coastal Practice Network, showing their depiction of Coriolis effect of a cannon shot on Earth due to the spin of the Earth. However, no such effect actually happens because the Earth is not a globe and it does not spin. Indeed, if there were truly a Coriolis effect on Earth as depicted in the above illustration, then the artillery officers and snipers would be trained to consider the spin of the Earth in making their calculations for accurate firing. Yet you will look in vain for any mention of Coriolis effect in any military artillery or sniper instruction manual. In all the wars fought through history, no soldier has ever been instructed to consider the Coriolis effect of a spinning earth when sighting in a target with his artillery piece or other weapon. The folly of adjusting for a mythical Coriolis effect would be immediately apparent, and the soldier's round would travel off course and miss the target. This author, Edward Hendry, is a former Federal Firearms Instructor. I have seen many thousands of rounds shot from all kinds of firearms at various distances. I have never witnessed any round fired ever be affected by the alleged Coriolis effect. I have never read the Coriolis effect discussed in any firearms manual, nor have I ever heard it be discussed by any firearms instructor as something to consider in the use of any firearm from any distance. If in the real world, those whose lives depend on the accuracy of their performance using weapons do not consider the Coriolis effect, that is convincing evidence that there is no Coriolis effect on Earth. That means that the Earth is not spinning. All of the pretty colored diagrams showing a spinning Earth with cannonballs going off course due to the supposed Coriolis effect depict an unreal myth. The Earth is fixed and does not move. End of chapter 8. Indeed, the Earth does not move, at least according to the scriptures, it certainly doesn't. As I talked about in part 3, the Bible and the still flat Earth, there are over 60 scriptures referencing the motion of the sun, moon, and stars. Zero scriptures reference the Earth in any sort of movement, rotation, orbiting, or otherwise. But what about science? Have there been any experiments that show us the Earth is not rotating? Yes, there sure has. In 1887, an experiment shattered the scientific community. Michelson and Morley tried to check the speed of the Earth through the ether as it orbited the Sun by passing light in two directions, one in the direction of the Earth's travel and one at right angles, and then comparing them for differences. They expected to measure a speed of about 30 kilometers per second. To their amazement, there was no movement of this order. They called it a null result. They actually measured 1 to 10 kilometers per second, but it was still called a null result. They rushed out the theory called the Fitzgerald Lorenz contraction. This claimed that the tube in line with the direction of movement shortens as it moves through the ether. There was no evidence whatsoever for this, it was only a way of getting over the implication that the Earth was stationary. Later in 1905 and 1915, Einstein produced his relativity theories which overcame the troublesome Michelson-Morley experiment by simply abolishing the ether. The whole theory is riddled with contradictions and problems. In 1913, Sanyak carried out a simple experiment of passing light in opposite directions around a table and recombining them. This produced interference fringes. He then rotated the whole table at two revolutions per second and found that the fringes changed. This result has very significant implications in science. It works as follows. A beam of light leaves the light source at the bottom left hand corner and is 
split into two different beans which we have coloured red and blue just to distinguish them. They travel round the circuit in opposite directions until they eventually reach the splitter which also recombines them. There they then go on to the photographic plate where they have interference fringes. In this simplified version we see that the beam is split into two, the red and the blue again, and they go round the circuit and are recombined at the splitter and recombining prism so that they again produce the fringes on the photographic plate. Now let us rotate the table. Before we do so, there is the very important subject of the effect of the ether. The Michelson Morley experiment failed to detect the 30 kilometers per second motion of the Earth through the ether. So as to overcome this problem, Einstein simply abolished the ether in his relativity theory. The very significant result of the Sanyak experiment was that it proved that the ether existed. Let us see how it did this. It is a fundamental feature of relativity that it claims that as there is no ether, light travels away from a source at the same speed relative to the source, whether the source is moving or not. Thus, whether the table is turning or not, the fringe patterns should stay the same. But if the ether exists, once the light has left the source, the speed of the light is controlled by the ether, independent of the speed of the table, mirrors, etc., as we see here. So let us see what happens when we rotate the table. Here, the light is split, and the red and blue lights go in opposite directions. But notice that the left-hand mirror has moved around in such a direction that the distance the red light has to travel is further. Now in relativity, the same time should be taken because the splitter is also moving and the distance between them is the same. But, now imagine that the ether exists and the speed of the light is controlled by the stationary ether. Imagine the ether like a thick treacle that limits how fast the light can travel independent of the motion of the light source, the splitter or the mirrors. The result is that the red light takes longer to reach the left-hand mirror. Similarly, the right-hand mirror is coming towards the blue light, so it reaches the mirror quicker. After they change ends, the red light again takes longer to reach the recombiner, whilst the blue light gets there quicker again. So they reach the photographic plate with a delay between them, and this changes the fringe pattern. In fact, Sanyak, using the speed of the rotation of the table, calculated how much the fringes should change, and found that they did change by just that amount. The crucial feature of this experiment is that it demonstrates that the ether does exist, which demolishes relativity. How does the scientific establishment deal with this result? By muddying the waters with scientific gobbledygook. Wikipedia says, In the above discussion, the rotation mentioned is a rotation with respect to an inertial reference frame. Since this experiment does not involve a relativistic velocity, the same wording is valid both in the context of classical electrodynamics and special relativity. How on earth can it be valid in both theories? It clearly proves that the ether exists because the speed of the light is controlled by the ether independent of the rotating table and mirrors. This Sanyak effect is used by airlines for their compass directions. As the plane turns, 
the change in the fringes are translated into a change in the direction of the plane that then registers on the cockpit compass. If a telescope is pointing at a star, and both are stationary, then obviously the light comes straight into the telescope. In 1729, Bradley found that he had to tip his telescope forward very slightly to get a star in the centre of his telescope. It was assumed that this was due to the motion of the Earth around the Sun. Let us assume that the telescope was moving at 5 mile an hour and had to be tipped 5 degrees. This 5 degree tipping, however, could equally be caused by the ether moving at 5 mile an hour carrying the stars around the Earth. As we see here, the light would be coming in at the same angle and the telescope would still have to be tipped 5 degrees. So tipping the telescope does not tell us whether it is the starlight moving or the telescope moving. However, there is a simple experiment that can determine whether it was the Earth that was moving or the ether and starlight. All that you had to do was record the tipping required for any particular star, then fill the telescope with water which greatly slows down the speed of light in the telescope. So here is the moving telescope filled with water, tipped at 5 degrees, and you can see that the starlight does not now reach the eyepiece at the bottom. This is because the starlight moves much more slowly when passing through water. However, if the telescope is tipped further, say 10 degrees, then the starlight will then be visible again in the eyepiece. It has to be tipped further because the light is now slower when in the telescope. But if the starlight is going past the telescope at 5 mile an hour, then when it is filled with water, no t further tipping is needed because the light is coming in at 5 degrees anyway. The starlight stays on the same path, but is only travelling slower in the water. To recap, if it is the telescope that is moving, then when it is filled with water, it has to be tipped further to see the star. If the telescope is stationary and the starlight drifting past us, then it does not have to be tipped further. In 1871, George Biddle Airy, the Astronomer Royal, performed this experiment. This is a copy from his original report. You can see that the two readings are virtually identical. If it had been the telescope that was moving, Airy expected a figure of 30 seconds of arc. In fact, he only managed to read 0.8 seconds of arc difference. Bradley first discovered stellar aberration, and it is interesting that in his report, Airy mentions that it was now about 100 seconds of arc, and that it was still slowly diminishing. This indicates that the speed of light was still decreasing in measurable amounts when Airy performed his experiment in 1871. The result of Airy's experiment, known as Airy's failure, was that the telescope does not have to be tipped further. This proved that it was the incoming light that was moving past a stationary telescope fixed to the stationary Earth. What is interesting in his very brief report of only four pages is that not once did he refer to the astonishing results that the experiment proved that the Earth was stationary.
This experiment was also dismissed by Wikipedia, which said, Ether drag test, under the main article, Luminiferous Ether. By means of a water-filled telescope, Airy, in 1871, looked for a change in stellar aberration through the refracting water due to an ether drag. Like in all other ether drift experiments, he obtained a negative result. This is a gross distortion of the truth. That he did not have to change the angle proved that it was the ether drifting past the stationary surface of the Earth. This experiment is never taught to university science students. They might begin to question what they were being taught about the cosmos, the universe, the Big Bang, evolution, and much else, if it was realized that the Earth really is at the center of the universe, which is rotating around us. And I'll stop that video there and just play a few minutes worth of Eric DeBay's 200 Proofs Earth is Not a Spinning Ball video book with a few clips dealing with this topic. 19. Tycho Brahe famously argued against the heliocentric theory in his time, positing that if the Earth revolved around the Sun, the change in relative position of the stars after six months' orbital motion could not fail to be seen. He argued that the stars should seem to separate as we approach and come together as we recede. In actual fact, however, after 190 million miles of supposed orbit around the sun, not a single inch of parallax can be detected in the stars, proving that we have not moved at all. 20. If Earth were truly constantly spinning eastwards at over a thousand miles per hour, vertically fired cannonballs and other projectiles should fall significantly due west. In actual fact, however, when this has been tested, vertically fired cannonballs shoot upwards an average of 14 seconds ascending, 14 seconds descending, and fall back to the ground no more than two feet away from the cannon, often directly back into the muzzle. 21. If the Earth were truly constantly spinning eastward at over a thousand miles per hour, helicopters and hot air balloons should be able to simply hover over the surface of the Earth and wait for their destinations to come to them. 22. If Earth were truly constantly spinning eastward at over a thousand miles per hour, during the Red Bull stratosphere dive, Felix Baumgartner, spending three hours ascending over New Mexico, should have landed 2,500 miles west into the Pacific Ocean, but instead landed a few dozen miles east of the takeoff point. 23. Ball believers often claim gravity magically and inexplicably drags the entire lower atmosphere of the Earth in perfect synchronization up to some undetermined height where this progressively faster spinning atmosphere gives way to the non-spinning, non-gravitized, non-atmosphere of infinite vacuum space. Such nonsensical theories are debunked, however, by rain, fireworks, birds, bugs, clouds, smoke, planes and projectiles, all of which would behave very differently if both the ball earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastward at a thousand miles per hour. 24. If earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastward over a thousand miles per hour, then north-south facing cannons should establish a control, while east firing cannonballs should fall significantly farther than all others, while west firing cannonballs should fall significantly closer. In actual fact, however, regardless of which direction cannons are fired, the distance covered is always the same. 25. If Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastwards over a thousand miles per hour, then the average commercial airliner, traveling 500 miles per hour, should never be able to reach its eastward destinations before they come speeding up from behind. Likewise, westward destinations should be arrived at thrice the speed, but this is not the case. 26. Quoting Heaven and Earth by Gabrielle Henriette, If flying had been invented at the time of Copernicus, there is no doubt that he would have soon realized that his contention regarding the rotation of the Earth was wrong, on account of the relation existing between the speed of an aircraft and that of the Earth's rotation. If the Earth rotates, as it is said, at a thousand miles an hour, and a plane flies in the same direction at only five hundred miles, it is obvious that its place of destination will be farther removed every minute. 
On the other hand, if flying took place in the opposite direction to that of the rotation, a distance of 1,500 miles would be covered in one hour instead of 500, since the speed of the rotation is to be added to that of the plane. It could also be pointed out that such a flying speed of 1,000 miles an hour, which is supposed to be that of the Earth's rotation, has recently been achieved, so that an aircraft flying at this rate in the same direction as that of the rotation could not cover any ground at all. It would remain suspended in midair over the spot from which it took off, since both speeds are equal. 27. If Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastwards over a thousand miles per hour, landing airplanes on such fast-moving runways, which face all manner of directions, north, south, east, west, and otherwise, would be practically impossible. Yet, in reality, such fictional concerns are completely negligible. Alright, I suggest you watch the rest of that video. It's really good, 200 proofs. And uh, as I bring this video to a close, I want to address one more thing. And that is the directional rotation of hurricanes. You know, it is true that hurricanes rotate one way in the so-called northern hemisphere and another way in the so-called southern hemisphere. But we've just established that the Earth is not rotating. So whatever is going on, it has nothing to do with the Earth's rotation. And I'm just going to put this forward for some consideration. I saw a video that Carly Sunshine put out where this woman just took like a plate and moved it across a pool and it created these vortexes that were spinning in opposite directions and went all the way across the pool. So could it be that there is an ether that Tesla and many others believed in for a long time until Einstein came along and came up with a bunch of math problems to nullify the ether? That there, if there is some sort of medium through which the sun and moon are going, then maybe as these heavenly luminaries go through this ether, perhaps it creates some sort of current which makes the winds flow in very specific ways on either side of the path of the sun and moon. So maybe it's just the movement of these heavenly bodies going through the ether that are creating vortexes that just so happen to spin one way if you're on the inside of the circle and one way if you're on the outside. Either way, whatever's going on is affected by the equator. Maybe this is an easier way to visualize it. You see the sun moving along its happy path here. Woo -hoo, and it's creating in its wake opposite rotating vortexes as it goes. You know, in the northern hemisphere, it's rotating counterclockwise and the southern clockwise. Uh, and interestingly enough, I found this animation done by a YouTube channel called Tech Insider. And it says that it turns out tropical storms don't come to within five degrees latitude of the equator. Wonder why? And it says they will likely never cross it either. And that's because of the winds pushing the storms away from the equator. Well, I mean, if that's the path of a localized sun and moon going around the circle of the Earth, it just kind of makes sense that they're not going to get in the path of it. They're going to only be affected by, if you will, the wake that's left behind through the ether. Anyway, I, you know, I could be totally off on that, and that's fine. For me, the whole thing is resolved by the fact that the Earth is not rotating. But as it pertains to what I just showed you, uh, I would suggest you spend some time on the Thunderbolts Project YouTube channel. Now, these guys are not flat earthers, but they are making a really compelling case for the electromagnetic plasma universe thesis. And I've got a lot of really interesting things there regarding the sun and moon and the planets and stuff like that and how potentially what the real nature of these things may be. And along similar lines to electromagnetism, as it pertains to the movement of weather patterns, I would suggest you watch these videos here by Richard Hopkins from the YouTube channel Mr. Thrive and Survive. He has some interesting insights, uh, and as I understand it, he comes from actually uh, having a meteorological background. Uh, I was going to put those videos here, but just for the sake of time, uh, I'll say, you know, go ahead and check them out in their entirety for yourself. But, you know, flat earth aside, I would just suggest you go out and watch the documentary The Principle.
I've said it before and I'll say it again. The principle is sort of like the gateway drug to flat earth anyway, because it's all about geocentricity, describing a stationary earth above which the sun, moon, and stars and planets and everything else are moving. You know, it's a, a geostation now. They don't believe in flat earth. They still believe in the globe. But I believe they have made a rock-solid scientific case to prove, alongside of the other scientific cases that have already been done, that this place is not moving. And so if the Earth is not rotating, then number eight is gone. Sorry, it's not a proof for the globe.